That's Enough Out of You podcast is sponsored by Todd John's Law. Unfortunately, bad things happen to good people, whether it's the result of an auto accident caused by the carelessness of another driver or being charged with a crime. Dealing with the aftermath of a personal injury accident or being involved with the criminal justice system can be extremely difficult. That's why, whatever you're facing, you should never go it alone. You need an experienced attorney who will stand by you every step of the way. Todd is experienced, licensed, trusted, respected, and guaranteed. No one will work harder or more diligently on your behalf, and he will personally handle your case from beginning to end. Located on Drinker Street in Dunmore, Pennsylvania, Todd has been representing the legal rights of Scranton and Wilkesbury personal injury victims and those accused of a crime for over 20 years. At Todd John's Law, the utmost priority is ensuring that your rights are always protected and that your case is resolved as quickly and fairly as possible so that you can move on with your life. Call Todd John's Law at 570-876-6903. With Todd John's Law, you will receive equal justice under the law. Welcome to That's Enough Out of You. I am your host, Bill Rader. And joining me, as he always does, is my co-host, Sean Kane. Sean, what's going on? Billy Graves, how you doing today, buddy? Uh, we're doing pretty good. I can't complain. We have a, a wonderful guest, a uh, returning guest, a friend of the show, and uh, somebody who is about to... Uh, about to to blow up as they say <laughs> and uh david whelan david welcome back to the program hey guys thanks for having me back yeah thanks absolutely. for coming back dave pleasure so the yeah the reason um why i say that dave is because your book is coming out this week the book which is entitled mind games the assassination of john lennon in which uh and we've talked about this before you've been on on our show a couple times and i highly recommend um, to our listeners to go back and listen to those episodes. We have uh, uh, the initial episode uh, where you came on um, to tell us about your, you know, some of your findings with this, this investigation. How long, David, is, have you been working on this? That's a good question, Bill. Uh, <laughs> I started uh, around about the summer of 2020. So yeah, over three years now. Wow. And uh, yeah, and that was that was a lot of what we talked about in our first uh, our first discussion with you. And then we had a uh, we had a lot of questions, a lot of comments and questions from our listeners that we that we um, went through. Uh, it was it really was wasn't that long ago. It was only a month or so, maybe six weeks or so ago um, that we had John for that. And you were kind enough to join us. And then uh, we we said we'd have you on when when your book was coming out and. Uh, it is coming out this week, so we're we're excited about that. I know you are. Yeah, very much so. Yeah, it, it feels uh, it, I, I, there's a sense of uh, relief, and it also feels like a bit of a release just to just to kind of get it out there and and see what the world makes of it. I, I've been sitting on a lot of information that I've been you know keeping to myself, and I just want the world to now you know see the whole thing. Yeah, look at the look at the whole picture. Get get to know characters that are around this uh, famous assassination that they weren't aware were around it and weren't aware that were connected to it. And then, you know, I'd be very interested to get people's feedback about what they feel really went down that night. And I think once they've read the book, they'll have a pretty good idea, I think, what went down that night. And uh, I think a lot of people are going to be shocked, to be honest. I, I would agree. I, I know I was. <laughs> um, and I didn't even more read the book. This book's not even out yet. Just, just There's more to come. Yeah. <laughs> That's more to come, Bill. Much more to come. Yeah. It's uh, yeah, and it's also just be nice to share it. You know, it's kind of. I was talking to someone about this the other day. I, I've really enjoyed it. I've really enjoyed the process, and I and I felt very early on that the information that I was beginning to unearth had to be put out there as almost like a kind of mission kind of thing. Uh, I, I, felt, I felt compelled to do it, and I felt you know it was just the right thing to do, and and I just want to. I think it'll be easier to share it with the world. I, I, it'll be kind of like letting a burden off, really. Um, mm. it, it's it's just it's been I've, I've enjoyed it. It's been exciting, and it's been uh, it's, it's it's been a bit of a roller coaster, obviously. But it, it's it's also been quite dark, and it's quite mm. it's quite disturbing, to be honest. And uh, 
And I think a lot of that will go away once the whole world knows about it. And I can kind of share the information with people and then just, you know, assess what they think about it. And, and I think what will happen is, what I hope will happen, is that a lot of the stuff that I put out there is, is so compelling and, and, and so clear uh, that there'll be a new investigation or at the very least there'll be new, new documentaries, new magazine articles, new journalists getting onto the case and people who have stayed in the shadows for a long time now, for 43 years, will be, will be taken out of the shadows and they'll be asked some awkward questions. And I'll be very interested to see how they react to that. Because a lot of people that I think possibly were involved in the conspiracy are still very much alive. Mm. So let's see. Let's see how the, uh, how the, how the cards will fall. But I, I think it's, uh, yeah, there's, there's going to be a lot of interest once people read the whole thing. And, and there'll probably be a lot of anger, actually, guys. I think, I think there's been a lot of hoodwinking going on. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, we, yeah, we, we know that from, from these other assassinations where we've, we've started to learn the truth. And I think, you know, it's what's interesting. And Sean and I talked about this a lot is, you know, like with the JFK assassination, it's finally starting to make its way into mainstream media. When I say it, I mean the truth, right? Yeah. It, we're finally little by starting, little, little by little. So, you know, if we, if we follow that trajectory by the year 2050, David, you're, you know, <laughs> That's an interesting point you made, Bill. I, I've noticed it, you know, sometimes, I mean, the mainstream channels are beginning to sort of talk about Oswald in the CIA. Yeah. You know, they're, 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 not, they're not going as far as we'd like them to go, but they're beginning to sort of focus on things that they never focused on before. Baby steps. Uh, and it, yeah, and it's, it's more difficult with, with, with JFK, I think, because, you know, he was a politician and, and right. you know, every politician that came in his wake is, 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 you know, was born from that horrific day. Um, so it's, it's a bit heavier, I think, the JFK thing, because, you know, with regards to Lenin in comparison, a very important figure, but, you know, from a political point of view, obviously nowhere, with, you know, with the same weight. So, yeah, it'd be interesting to see the reaction. I, I, I think you're right. I think it'll be a long time before the whole world yeah, it gets their head around the jet, the, the Lenin assassination, even you know as, as deep and as far and as wide as my book goes. I, I just, you know, I, I'm not, I'm not, I've not got any false hopes that Wikipedia is going to completely rewrite their John Lennon assassination page the following day. Um, I think it will. We've got a long way to go, but you know, that's you know, getting Wikipedia to come around to your way of thinking is certainly not my main goal in life. That's for sure. Right. Yeah. Well, I mean, you, you know, you're 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 breaking new ground, I think, and and that's that's important. yeah, it's very important. Thanks. Hey, Sean, what? How do we want to do this now? What do you have? Do we have more well, questions? For yeah, David? we got some listener questions, and then I got I got a couple of my own. I'm, I'm sure you got some, Billy. But uh, before we even get into that, Dave, is there anything else you want to say about the book before we get into the questions? Yeah, there is. Uh, it's it's. I'm very proud of it. It's the first thing I want to say. It's 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 quite long. It's quite deep. Uh, it goes into um, I don't I don't spend too much time on John Lennon's background. We all know that. Uh, obviously, I talk a lot about his New York years, or quite important, and the problems that he had with the FBI. Um, Yoko is quite important. She's she's covered to a fair bit to a fair degree. But the the main part of the book focuses on on Chapman, who he was who was behind him, who was with him all the way up until that fateful night. Uh, it then focuses on the murder to a kind of almost uh, crazy, detailed kind of, you know, level. I, I, I go into every single witness account. I go into every bit of forensics that we can that we can glean. And I give everybody every single side of it that we have and, and every single side of it that we haven't yet had. There's a lot of new witness testimony that I've managed to get from the lead detective's notebook. So I, I literally lay it all on the line. I, I throw everything out there and say to everybody, look, these are the different angles. These are the different ways of seeing this. And then I try to lead the reader into a kind of logical conclusion of what I believe happened. And I think it's fairly clear, to be honest. I think once you have all the evidence and all the witness testimony and all the sort of available forensics, albeit the forensics are very sparse, um, you can figure out, I think, what really happened that night, and it certainly wasn't what we told, what we were told happened. I think also after the murder, I go very much into Mark Chapman's 
um, incarceration, Mark Chapman's legal defence, and what happened to Mark Chapman after he was uh, sentenced to 20 years to life, and the people around Mark in that period of time, and and their motives, and what they were doing with Mark, and how they were guiding Mark. I think you can tell an awful lot from a conspiracy by the attempts of the people who were possibly involved in that conspiracy to to tie all up in a neat bow and to cover their tracks. And I think with the John Lennon assassination, what happened to Mark after the murder is very telling. And the book goes into that in quite in quite quite a lot of detail. And then it comes out with a summary at the end. And, and you know, I don't want to spoil the don't want to spoil the ending, but the summary is basically it wasn't what we were told it was and i give everybody my theory of what i think happened and um i think the evidence points more to my theory than the theory we've been told up to now all right very good um so let's get into some of these listener questions dave and these are from you know our, our last uh time that we had you on these and actually a couple of these might even be from the first time that we have you on we just didn't get to them all right. um so this first one is from jim richmond and uh, he says, was Dave able to do any measurements with the height of the shots in the door relative to the height of John Lennon if he were to follow the shot in the back story? Also, is there any evidence of Chapman's wife that she was an intel asset, or does he think anything like that? I thought I read one time that she was his travel agent, and that's how they met, and it's just very odd. Anyway, great okay. job exposing another disturbing chapter of darkness in our country. Okay, uh, two great questions. Um, so we'll, we'll start with the the, uh, the bullet holes in the glass panel vestibule doors. Um, for anyone who doesn't know, uh, the glass panel vestibule doors at the far right end of the driveway that John and Yoko were walking into when they were going home that night and got out of their limo. Mark Chapman was the other end of the driveway by the sidewalk on the opposite side. So as you look at it, Mark Chapman's on the left and these glass panel vestibule doors are on the far right. So if you can try and picture that in your mind's eye. Um, what we can see from the very sparse crime scene photos that were released is two, I would say kind of hip, lower stomach area, uh, kind of height uh, holes in the glass panels there's two two bullet holes round about that sort of like one with maybe sort of hip height sort of lower back height maybe you could say um the problem with those two low down bullet holes that we can see in the crime scene photos in those vestibule doors is that the, the actual doctors and nurses who've now come out and said no john was shot in his upper left chest it's very hard to square away where the bullets that pass through John from his upper left chest. And we know from the doctors and nurses that three bullets pass in the direct line of fire from his upper left back. How two of those bullets could kind of dive bomb downwards uh, to make those two holes in the glass panel vestibule doors. So th th they are a bit of a mystery from the new information that's come from the medical people I've spoken to. But if you, if you go with, let's, let's go with the official version for a moment. The official version is that John was shot two times in his back. They don't really specify where, uh, and two times in his left upper shoulder. That's kind of the autopsy official narrative as, as far as we can glean it because the autopsy has not been released, but people who have seen the autopsy have stated that, and there was discussion of those wounds at the autopsy press conference. So you've kind of got, we know that two bullets were kept, were found at the autopsy. Uh, from Elliot Gross, he put it in a, in a morgue seat. One was found in John's neck area, and that was one that they said probably came through the shoulder and ended up in the neck. And one was found in his jacket. So if you do the math, there's, there's two more bullets that are coming out of John somehow. One somewhere coming out of his back, coming through into his chest, because they, you know, they say he was shot in his back, not his front. And the other one was probably through his shoulder, and somehow, you know, came out possibly in his chest, maybe. Um, so you've got two bullets coming out that possibly could have passed through John and again, dive bomb downwards to be sort of those low bullet holes. But, but here's the problem, guys. I, I've spoken to 
the cops, all the cops that were there that night, and I've spoken to the Dakota workers that were there that night, and they've all confirmed to me one very, you know, they've all been sort of uniformed on one one particular thing, and they've all said the same thing that there were no blood, there was no blood splatter on those vestibule uh, bullet holes uh, in the glass panels. So you'd expect bullets passing through John to at least have a few specks of blood, you know, splattered on those doors, but they're not there. There is no blood either side of the uh, of the bullet holes in those vegetable doors. So they are a, a real mystery. I've, I've got a pretty good idea how they got there and I'll reveal it in my book, but the official narrative, it's interesting and very telling, never ever goes into those bullet holes because they can't square them away. They're almost impossible to square away with the official narrative. They're very difficult to square away with what we now know from the doctors and nurses, uh, just because they're so low down. Now with regards to measuring them, it's a good question, um, the night, or should I say, a day after the murder, possibly the second day, actually, it was probably, so the murder was on Monday the 8th, I think round about kind of Wednesday the 10th, those two glass festival doors, which are crucial evidence in the murder, I've got this from people who worked at the Dakota, they were taken down and they were thrown in the basement of the Dakota and left there for a couple of weeks. Um, and replaced with new vestibule doors. Now, you'd expect those doors to be taken away by the NYPD or the DA's office, but they weren't. They were thrown in the basement. Uh, and probably two weeks later, the glass panels inside the wooden doors and the door handles disappeared. Wow. Now, you could say they, they were taken away to maybe you know refurbish the doors, possibly. Can't see why they would do that. Um, but, but Joseph Manny, the guy who actually worked in the basement, confirmed that to me, that the, the glass panels and the door handles just disappeared. So whether that was a ghoulish uh, souvenir hunter, which is possible, or whether it was someone trying to destroy evidence, we'll probably never know. But, um, yeah, that, that evidence is gone. Well, it's disturbing that NYPD never took that in the evidence. Yeah. That's a disturbing yeah, thing. Oh, I was astonished because because Joe, you know, he kind of said it to me. I w always like it when a, when a witness sort of tells me something kind of offhand, sort of, you know, when I don't ask him the question. And he was kind of, we were talking about those doors. He's like, he's like, yeah, yeah, it's a bit strange, those doors. Yeah, they're kind of, there were holes. Yeah, no blood. Yeah, very odd. No ricochets as well. Very important points to point out here. Joe said that there was nothing on the walls in the, in that driveway. There were no kind of bullet holes in any of, any of the sort of walls. So God knows where those bullets went. But he then said to me, yeah, those doors, those vegetable doors, it's funny, he said, they were sort of thrown down in the basement a couple of days after the murder, he said, and they were kind of left there. And then he sort of said almost offhand, and he said, yeah, a couple of weeks later, it was funny, he said, the, um, the glass and the handles just disappeared. And I said, well, where did they go, Joe? Do you think someone took them to the account? And he went, no idea, it just someone took them. So it was kind of very casual the way he was telling me the story, which is how I kind of like it in a way. I don't, I don't like people being pressed with a question. So... It's sounding very true to me. Um, certainly in the police evidence vouchers that I have, and I have lots of them, there's no mention of, of those vestibule doors. Um, so, so yeah, I, I think with regards to the height, and I think we can probably figure it out, actually. There's, there's two or three photos we have of them, and I think, I hope one day somebody far smarter than me will do a digital reconstruction of that driveway as best we can from the photography we have and, and, and just kind of figure out exactly where those, you know, those bullets were from the ground upwards and, and you know, where John's wounds were and just figure out the kind of most likely scenarios. And I know you've got these things now where the police are using this kind of police crime scene kind of architecture, digital architecture kind of software where they figure out bullet trajectories with a, a digital recreation of a certain crime scene. So I'm hoping in the future someone will do that and uh, and we'll sort of figure out the most likely scenario of where those bullet holes came from. Right. We'll see. Um, how about the second part of the question, Dave? Um, is there any evidence of Chapman's wife that she was some kind of intel asset? Well, Gloria, how long have you got, guys? You're sitting down. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right, let's start. Let's start with Gloria. So, so Gloria, the, the first thing to, to mention about Gloria is that she was older than Mark, a couple of years older than Mark, much more experienced than Mark. She'd, she'd sort of done a lot of global traveling with her travel agency work, uh, much more worldly. Um, from the bits that Gloria's told us about her past, 
before she met Mark. She met Mark in, um, I should say, Mark, Mark moved to Hawaii in 1977 and she met Mark the next year in 1978. She organized, uh, late summer 78, she organized Mark's infamous trip around the world. That's where Mark allegedly first met her in a travel agent in Hawaii. And she's the one who kind of sorted out where he was going and where he was staying and all these interconnecting flights. And, and from that, apparently, romance blossomed when Mark came back from his amazing round the world trip on a janitor's wage. And he, um, they got married the following year in 79, the summer of 79. But, but from the kind of the point where he returned to the point where he got arrested uh, on uh, December the 8th in New York, um, Gloria was always by Mark's side to the point where she even gave up her travel agency work and started to work in um, Castle Memorial Hospital, which was a, uh, a mental mental health facility in Hawaii that Mark was being treated in. So she, Gloria made sure from a very early age, a very early time when they were together, that she was always there next to Mark. Um, what Gloria has revealed, what she did before she met Mark, and she revealed this on, a, of all places, a Christian website. She's a very... Uh, deeply devout Christian these days. Um, she said that she had, I quote, a promiscuous life uh, when she was an international travel agent. And she also dabbled in the occult, strangely. She decided to throw that one in there. Um, so strange lady, strange background. How she, what she saw in the kind of very unworldly uh, Mark Chapman is hard to kind of fathom, but hey, love moves in mysterious ways. Um, with regards to whether she was some kind of intelligent intelligent asset, here's the suspicious things about Gloria that I think people might believe that could be true. Uh, the first thing she did that was really suspicious and, and frankly unforgivable, and Mark has revealed this to, to, to journalists, is when Mark first went on his compelling uh, train-like mission to shoot John Lennon the first time, he went late October, early November. He, he said to Gloria he was going out to New York. I don't think he told her what he was going to do at that point, allegedly. But when he came back in early November, after not fulfilling his mission, he put his revolver and bullets from the revolver on a table in front of Gloria and said to her, I was in New York because I was desperately compelled to kill John Lennon. Um, and she, Mark didn't really go into how she reacted to that. But then a few weeks later, just, just three weeks later, Mark decides to go back to New York. Um, and Gloria, being a travel agent or an ex-travel agent, booked his plane tickets for him. And not only did she book his plane tickets for him, but she actually drove into the airport um, oh, to make boy. sure he got to make sure he got on his flight. Wow. Now the new, yeah, it's incredible. So uh, the way Gloria paints this is, Mark said he was going to New York to write a children's book. It's like okay, that's oh. interesting. He told you a few weeks ago he went there to shoot John Lennon. So did that right. not concern you at all? Now this actually concerned Mark. Would you believe uh, from? The time Mark was arrested till round about, let me get my years right here, till round about kind of, it might even be as late as 82, but it might be late 81, for a couple of years perhaps, probably, probably 18 months I would say for sure, Mark wouldn't see Gloria. He wouldn't allow her to come and visit him in his cell because he was so angry, to quote Mark, that she didn't shock him to the police when he first showed her the guns and bullets the first time in early November. Uh, so Gloria, uh, by not doing that really angered Mark. He said, why didn't you, you know, you could have stopped this. And why didn't she stop it? It's just incredible that she didn't. Um, so I, I, I would, I could see how people could easily see Gloria as almost an accomplice, to be honest with you, uh, for what she did and what she knew. Right. What's, really, what's really strange is a couple of other stranger things about Gloria. On the night of the murder, Mark, I did, I did a Substack article about this. Mark was, you know, they, they knew where he was, okay? So they kind of, they had his address in Hawaii. Uh, they had his driving license. They had 2,000 something of cash, too much money for Mark to have, but he had a lot, he had a couple of thousand dollars of cash on him. Uh, but they didn't release his name 
till round about 3 a.m. at a press conference that the chief of detectives, James Sullivan, gave. So Mark's name in the media wasn't released until that point, which is really important, not just for Gloria, but for other reasons as well, as, you, as you'll read in my book. The, the timing of when Mark's name was released is really important. But what happened was, so Mark's sitting in his cell in the police, in the police cell. He's, he's been there a couple of hours. He's given a statement, very confused, don't quite know what I did statement, don't know why I shot John Lennon, had nothing against him kind of thing. And then the phone rings, probably around about 2.50 a.m., okay? In the, in the police station, 20th precinct. So this is, a, this is about probably 10, 15 minutes before Mark's name was released to the press. And the person on the other end of the line, guys, would you believe, was Gloria Chapman. Um, ringing in to the 20th precinct police station to talk to her husband. Uh, now, <laughs> this was so weird that there was a guy there, a Lieutenant O'Connor, who spoke to a writer called Fenton Bresler in the 80s. And O'Connor said that when that phone call came in, the first thought he had in his mind was, this is a conspiracy. Oh, wow. Because how, how the hell could she know he was here? Right. And how the hell could she know how to get that number and the, the, the call protocols? And, you know, how is, how is this happening? Mm. You know, we haven't released the guy's name yet officially. And here she is ringing in. So that... That phone conversation, which I've, again, I've, I've done an article on it, I've put it on my substack. It's, it's a really mentally draining phone conversation where she, this, this kind of, they're both, you can tell they're desperate to say more than they're really saying. And, it, and that's, that phone conversation is probably, I think, one of the biggest bits of evidence that Mark was more involved in this than probably we've been led to believe by thinking he was a, a brainwashed mentoring candidate. It seems like he's kind of protecting Gloria. And it seems like he's kind of wary of giving too much away. So he's kind of talking like, you know, get in touch with that lawyer we know, Gloria. But he's not releasing, the, he's not saying the Gloria's name on the phone. Do you know what I mean? He's kind of, he's kind of advising her. And she's kind of, in her part, she's sounding him out. She's kind of going, do you know what you've done, Mark? And why did you do it? And it's almost like she's seeing how much he remembers and how much he knows about how he got into this situation. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a really difficult thing to read or, or to hear. And it was released, um, the police recorded it. And it was released on a documentary a couple of years ago, which is great because it means, means you know, all listen in and, 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 and analyze what they were saying. So that, that whole Gloria phone call into the station thing, you, you could, I could see how people might think, and I think O'Connor thought this, but that was very much a fact finding mission from Gloria by the people behind the conspiracy to assassinate John Lennon to actually call Mark and figure out what he remembers. Mm. What does he remember? How does he, what does he, how does he know he's there? Does, does he sort of remember why he's there? And, and, and is he going to, is he going to stay quiet? Wow. Is he going to keep on side? It, it's, it's just, a, I really recommend everyone, you know, go to my Substack and read it. I think it's called Gloria Chapman in a Time Machine. <laughs> I think I call the article. But it's it's an interesting it's an interesting article and it's an interesting episode. But then it gets worse, guys, because about a day later, Gloria hires this lawyer that Mark allegedly alluded to in the phone call. It was a law, it was a guy called Brooke Hart, who's a very established, no doubt, incredibly expensive lawyer um, from Hawaii. Very connected guy, Brooke Hart. He knows he kind of. He knows all the top lawyers of the time. I think he was a friend of Dershowitz as well. Is it Dershowitz? I've got that name right, Alan Dershowitz. Alan Dershowitz. 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 Yeah, Dershowitz. Yeah. 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 I think they were friends, which is an interesting connection. Um, but interestingly, so Brooke Hart has always made out that Gloria called him that night, kind of concerned that she needed the lawyer to help her out. But actually, um, Mark gave the game away by saying, get hold of that lawyer that we know. Uh, so I think Brooke knew lawyer, uh, knew Brooke knew Gloria and Mark before that night, which is interesting. Um, so basically, what, what Brooke's big idea was, he said, let's call a press conference, Gloria, and we'll just we'll just get it out of the way, and we'll just have you sit in there. We'll let the press ask you all these difficult, awkward questions, and all you've got to do is just sit there looking kind of distressed and you know say, oh, I'm so upset, blah blah blah. So she did this. Very hard to find this. Uh, press conference in full, uh, you know, to find, you know, the full transcripts and the full video that is really difficult. I've managed to get some clips. I've got a pretty good idea what she said now. So, some of the most disturbing stuff she said was, you know, she sort of said, I was kind of pleased that 
that Mark, you know, had managed to achieve something. Now, this is, actually, I've got that wrong. She actually said that in, a, in an article further down the line after the press conference. What she said at the press conference was, she said, uh, it's such a shame that John had to die. And I remember thinking, why did he have to die? Mm. Mm. She said that twice. She said that twice. She said, yeah, it's such a shame that he had to die. And I'm like, well, what? Just, and just very cold, very unemotional. Playing the you know the usual cards. I love my husband, and you know, you know, I'm so sad for the other family. Blah blah blah. She played the card. What didn't come out in that press conference was that she drove Mark to the airport and bought his tickets. Right. So the journalists, the journalists weren't really doing their job at that point. Sadly, they've, they've not been doing their job for 43 years. But right. But yeah, that that would have been interesting if that had come out, and and also it would have been interesting if it didn't come out that you'd told her three weeks earlier that. You know, when he placed the gun and bullets in front of her, he went off to New York to try and kill John Lennon. So none of that came out. When she spoke to Jim Gaines in 1987, or probably a bit earlier, 85, 86, the, the article came out in 87 in People magazine. When she spoke to journalist Jim Gaines, she did actually come out with an incredible line, which I said earlier. She actually said to Jim, uh, I was really happy in a strange way that Mark had managed to achieve something. And I just thought, how can you say that? That's... How, can you... <laughs> how can you be happy that he's killed yeah. one of the most famous men in the world, allegedly? Yeah, uh, really. So, so yeah, so Gloria at that point, see, she kind of got her way back into Mark's cell, just winding back a little bit. Mark wouldn't see her for, for 18 months, but she managed to wheedle her way back into Mark's cell after a couple of years. She was desperate to get in that cell. Uh, and desperate, she kept writing letters and kept ringing them up and kept saying, I think you're possessed by demons. And I think, you know, you need, you need to, you know, need my love to help you fight this thing. And, and she eventually got back into Mark's favour. And um, I think you've probably all read over the years the kind of official narrative that she's the kind of ever faithful wife who still visits Mark all the time and stuck by his side. And that's kind of partly true. She... She does visit him from time to time, much less than she used to. Um, apparently, they slept together now and again when she visited him, but we can't ever get that verified. Um, she's very much now doesn't want to talk about Catcher, doesn't want to even talk about demons. She's kind of she just wants to kind of say Mark did it for fame, that old chestnut, um, and now he's just in the hands of the Lord and he's into Jesus. And, and they write this really crass Christian pamphlet that they send around different prisons, which, which has this awful font that says like John Lennon's killer in a kind of frenzied font. And then, in, and so they're kind of using Mark's infamy to kind of mm. sell a Christian message. It's just so crass. Oh. Um, so so they, they send that out. That's something they do. And the person who funds that is an interesting man who I'll reveal more about in my book. But yeah, if, the, the, the last thing I'll say on Gloria, guys, is if you want to get to Mark, if you want to talk to him in prison or you want to arrange an interview or anything like that, you have to go through Gloria. Right. She's very much the gatekeeper for Mark at the moment um, and has been, I think, for quite a long time. Her and one other person who, are, again, I'll reveal in my book. And, you know, she's a person of great interest, guys. Let's put it that way. Because I think if, if you wanted to have a handler, for Mark Chapman, she was the perfect person to be that that person. You know, she and she was. She did handle all his affairs. You know, she she was very much constantly by his side from seventy eight until you know the 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 day he flew out to New York the second time. So yeah, yeah, person of interest. That was a very long answer. Sorry, guys. Oh, that's yeah. excellent, David. That's really good. Two really good questions by Jim Richmond. So thanks yeah, for that, Jim. And, and, and if, if I could jump in real quick, I just have a, a follow up on that, David, about the timeline. Yes, yeah, so, so and and I don't know how much of this you know you can talk about here. Or, you know what what you're saving for your book and whatever is fine. Uh, but but my question is so so obviously the information went went public that you know that John Lennon had been killed. Um, yeah. They hadn't released Mark's name, but Gloria calls. The precinct. She calls the police station and asks mm -hmm. for him. Now, is it mm -hmm. is there is it possible that 
because she knew that he had he was thinking about doing this or that he had gone there before to do this and maybe she couldn't get a hold of him and she thought to herself oh no he did it i, I better call the police station is, is that a possibility or do you think there's no question she she had not she was tipped off or she was part of a you know i i, I don't know what what do you think about that I think it is a possibility. I think you're right, Bill. I, I think absolutely it's a possibility. I think she I think she knew. I think the minute it came on, I think she said that actually. I think in an interview she said, Oh, when I heard John Lennon was had been shot and and had been killed, I thought, Oh God, is it Mark? You know, you went there. Oh my mm. God, is it Mark? Yeah. And um, the problem is for her to know that the 20th precinct was the precinct that covered the Dakota. And for her to know that the call protocols to call in and get and get to Mark, I, I find that pretty difficult. I, I think someone at the MYP, here's what I think happened. I think an insider at the MYPD called her. Potentially an insider that was part of the conspiracy. And I think that insider gave her all the details about when to call and how and who to, because she basically, she called in and uh, the guy, there's a police officer called Officer Spiro, who was the first arresting officer on Mark, who was by Mark's side, almost like a nurse. It's just incredible how much Spiro cared for Mark. Uh, and Mark would only talk to Spiro or have anything to do with Spiro. He, he wouldn't go through any other cop than Spiro. They, they built up this really weird relationship from the very first few minutes they met to the point where they exchanged letters, would you believe? When Mark went to prison, it was a very bizarre, slightly yeah. inappropriate relationship. But Gloria rang through, and Spiro's the guy who first took the call. Then you've got Detective Hoffman, who got, and I spoke to Ron about this. He said, I took the phone because I just couldn't quite believe this was happening. It's like, how the, how the hell does she know he's here? And he's like, who's this? You know, like, it's Gloria, the wife. Oh, really? Okay, you want to talk to him? And I think it was quite a smart move for them to allow her to talk to him because obviously they recorded the conversation. We sure, yeah. yeah. And, you know, you could, you could glean some information. I think you're right. I, I think there is a possibility she got lucky and just kind of rang up. But there's gosh, lots of different police stations she could have yeah. called. Yeah. Uh, and I just don't think she could have got that information. Uh, she made out that a newspaper man called her. You see, this is the problem, you see, um, with your theory, Bill. She made out that a newspaper guy called her uh, and told her the news about Mark and, uh, you know, Mark was arrested for doing it. But there's no way that guy really could have known that information at that point. Again, unless someone leaked it in the 20th yeah. precinct, which again, which again is possible. Sure. It is sure. possible. Yeah. It's just unlikely, I think. It's a bit unlikely. It's, it's, yeah. a troubling, it's a troubling call. But I think what troubles me more is not, not the fact that she made the call and got through at such an early hour. It's just the content of the call. It's just a call to me that seems like two people in on something that are trying to check in with each other and uh, and just make sure they're both still uh, playing along the right way. Right. You know, she said something. I can't remember what it is now, but it, I remember we recall it vividly. He sort of said, you shouldn't have done that. That is almost like that's out of your pay grade was his kind of vibe. Mm. You know, and, and I think if, if there's any evidence that Mark was in on it and was kind of played. It's that phone call for me that he was kind of part of it as well and just, you know, was playing a role. And uh, I still don't think Mark fired, I don't think Mark fired the bullets that killed John Lennon, but he, there's, that doesn't mean to say that he wasn't there nefariously and not hypnotized fully and aware that he was trying to kill John Lennon for other reasons. And that's still very much up for debate. Right, uh, and that, that phone call to me is is probably the strongest indication that Mark might have been part of some kind of plot. Possibly, I, I still think on balance, it's not that's not the case, but it's a very interesting phone call. All right, uh, next question, Dave is very interesting question. Um, this is from Collins uh, from County Cork, Ireland. All right, I know I know Cork well. Yeah, me too. I was there. Beautiful Got place. Family down there. Got family oh, nice. There. <laughs> um, he says, we know the American CIA works closely with British intelligence groups, and John mm -hmm. Lennon was angering British intelligence, British angering the British government as well as the American government. So, was mm -hmm. there any evidence of British intelligence involvement in this crime? 
Uh, this is interesting, Dave, because I, I follow, you know, a lot of the, the situation in Northern Ireland. And I know Lenin was was part of his activism was, you know, he was he was supporting Irish nationalism. And I know the British weren't happy about that. And the government was uh, angered by that. So did you have any evidence that there was any involvement uh, from from British groups like SIS or MI6? Another great question. Another great question. Um, OK, so. I think the first part we need to focus on is 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 MI5, MI6 accountability. And what British intelligence agencies haven't had that you guys have had in the mid-70s with the church committee hearings and the congressional hearings is they haven't had a day of reckoning. So it's, it's long overdue, by the way. Uh, yeah, I think definitely. Should, should I have agree. a day of reckoning. Uh, but because they haven't, uh, to get information about what MI5 and MI6 actually got up to on any particular case, not just John Lennon, but whatever you want to talk about, it's impossible. Uh, it, it's it's water time um, to the point where even even just the, just the odd document here and there at, at the National Archives, it, it's just really hard to get in there and get a document that's kind of benign. You know, it, even the benign stuff is hard to get hold of. Wow. Um, so with regards to what they have on John Lennon, it's never been released and never will be released. Um, so I think the problem with figuring out whether MI5, MI6 has anything to do with it, and we, I think we all know that internationally, things like MI5, MI6, CIA, FBI, Mossad, we could go on and on. Sad, yeah, these, definitely. These guys are all part of the same club, for sure. They are, yes. Uh, I mean, they have to be. It's, it's an operation. Yeah, they work they together. To. How else could they not do it? So I think with regards to whether they would see John as a person of interest, 100%, 100%. Because interestingly, there's a, there's a guy I spoke to a bit uh, called Tony Bramwell, who's um, a lovely guy, Tony, and he grew up with the Beatles in Liverpool. And he, you know, he used to get the bus to school with them and stuff. You know, he really, he really was, and he carried their guitars around in the early days. You know, Tony knows them all really well. He's seen the whole, he, he did a lot of their videos. You know, I don't know if you've seen the Penny Lane, Strawberry, Lane, Strawberry Fields videos and stuff. That's all Tony's work. So Tony was a real insider. And Tony told me something really interesting. He said McCartney, Harrison and Lennon all had Irish heritage. And they all, in the early days, considered themselves Irish. 100% Irish. Right. But, but they were clever enough to know, this is my theory now, not, not Bramwell's. I think they were clever enough to know that to get on in the British music pop field, uh, it might be better to say you're English or say you're British. Sure. Kind of like with yeah. actors like Peter O'Toole and, and you know, others, you see that. You got it. And it's wise, you know, part of the Irish stuff, so people can relate to you more in the country that you were born and, you know, you're making right. a success. So they did that, I think, kind of strategically. And a lot of people do that, as you say, and, and have done, to, in, in, interestingly, I've kind of done it a bit myself, to be honest. Um, uh, it, it's, it, I think there is... Don't want to make a big thing of this, but I think some people still do have prejudice against the Irish. Um, oh, no doubt. There's no doubt, Dave. Yeah, and you know, in this country, to be fair, they had a lot of problems with Irish terrorism throughout the 70s and 80s, mm -hmm. and even early 90s. So, you know, it, it's, it was difficult for me as, as a child in the 70s with Irish parents and Irish family to see all this stuff going on and to hear the, you know, the anger about it. And then, you know, it was quite conflicting, but that's a whole other story. But yeah, so getting back into my five and my six, we know that John, when he moved to New York, was in contact with Irish Republicans, uh, and he was very much thinking about doing a concert. We know he did a song called um, uh, "The Luck of the Irish," I believe it was called. Uh, not a particularly, not a particularly great song. Uh, and he also did a song, I think, called "Sunny Bloody Sunday," about obvious, obvious subjects. Didn't um, he say give Ireland back to the Irish? Didn't he? Do, yeah, is that and he went on a, um, he went on a, he went, you know, when he was in London, just before he came to America, or when he came back from America the first time, spent a bit more time in London, he went on an RAA march, um, you know, with, with, you know, carrying placards, pro IRA placards. So you can be absolutely certain someone that famous uh, saying those kind of things, supporting those kind of causes, would have been very much on MI5, MI6's radar and would have been despised for doing those. Uh, for doing those, uh, for those protests and, and releasing those songs, I, I think the only reason he didn't do the concert in the end was someone whispered in his ear, "John, if you if you actually go off to Northern Ireland and and play a concert, they probably won't let you back in." 
he didn't quite he didn't quite figure out you know the mechanics of it bless him um but yeah with regards to whether i think they're involved um no okay i don't i don't and the reason i say that i think they might have given some intel assistance who knows i mean it's impossible to sell right so people i think who were involved i don't think were linked to or associated with those with mi5 mi6 but you know whether they were they gave support who knows and we'll never know we'll never know we'll, ne- we'll never know the cia and fbi's full involvement possibly in these kind of things because you know even though you had your church committee and you had your congressional committee in 75 and boy were they interesting you know obviously that's how we found out about mk ultra and that's how we found out about things like heart attack guns my god heart attack guns um you know <laughs> We we still don't know what everything that went on, do we? Let's be honest. And we only oh. know about MK Ultra because they made a mistake and sent some files to the accounts department. You know, right. and if it wasn't for that error, well, I think it was Richard Helms, wasn't it? We would, Richard Helms, he destroyed most of the records. Yeah, yeah. You know, we wouldn't have known. So who knows what other MK Ultras we don't know about in 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 the CIA's dark history and in MI5 and MI6's dark history. I, I, you know, it's long overdue in this country for people, independent assessors, to go into those agencies and actually get full access and see what these guys got up to. But we're never going to do that because they'll always play their ultimate brilliant trump card. We can't let you see that because it's in the you know interest of national security. National security. Yep. Good old national security. Yep. And it's and it's kind of scary, guys, isn't it? Let's be honest. I can see why people don't push these guys because look look at the James Bond logo. Right. Yeah, they they fart it in your face. We've got a license to kill, baby. Yeah. We can we Definitely. can take you out and we can do what we like, you know, and, and we've got no comeback. And that's yeah. that's a fact. So you have to kind of think and believe and hope that they're all James Bonds, but I think we know they're not. So no, no. no. You, know, so, you know, it's kind of it's scary for people. And I think a lot of people don't even want to think about it, never let them go there. Sure. But it's long, long overdue. And you guys do much more over your side of the pond, we're trying to get the CIA and FBI to, you know, to come to heel and, and to release records. I mean, it's it's much better, you know, coming from your side. There's nothing really going on here with regards to disclosure on MI5, MI6. You, you get a little bit about the Royals. That sometimes causes problems. People look into various things, that, horrible things that the Royals may have got up to, and, and people try and go via that route, and they try to, you know, get Royal records released and stuff. All that's, you know, Oh, that's redacted and and it's sealed off. And um, yeah, I I I think on balance, guys, to answer the question, no, I don't. I don't think MI5 and MI6 were involved, but okay, they possibly assisted. Would not surprise me. Yeah, but I, don't I have a little assisting. To be honest, I think it was it was very much a US operation, wasn't it? I have a little story here. I just want to go sideways for a quick second here. Sure. Uh, because it tied tie the Northern Ireland situation into something with JFK. I don't know if people are aware of this, but the driver, the limo driver, William Greer, um, yeah. who did a lot of suspicious things. Now, this might totally mean nothing, but it's an interesting uh, factoid. You know, uh, William Greer, in an interview later on, he said about how his family was from Northern Ireland, uh, but they they were unionists, they were Protestants, and um, they didn't support JFK, and they were very much against him because he was a Catholic, and he was Irish Catholic, and he said, you know, he said some rather negative things, and, you know, he did do some really suspicious things there by not, you know, not speeding away when he could have, and then he looked back, and he and he see that Kennedy was hit, and then he finally moved, uh, the, you know, so sure. it might mean nothing, but it's just interesting how he said that later on, and, and it ties into the the kind of hatred that that the, the Irish still that's, experience uh, to this day, uh, you know. That's incredible, Sean. It's absolutely incredible information. I, I never knew that. And and yeah, that that I mean, as someone who you know has been to Ireland many times, you know, it's it's, it's better now. Thank yeah. God. Yeah. Ireland, it's there's still you know tensions there, but it's much better. No one's blowing each other up anymore. But but oh, yeah, that, I, that, when that, I was there, there was a lot of tension still. But it's oh, yeah. it's better now. I was, it's there, but it's, it's definitely bad. But back in the day, you know, the hatred between the Protestants and the Catholics in Northern Ireland was intense. Sure. For obvious reasons, both sides are blowing each other up. Right. So, yeah, for Greer to, to have those allegiances uh, and to be driving a car of one of the world, yeah. the world's most prominent Catholics, that is very sure. interesting. It's just I interesting, think- and it might mean nothing, Dave. It might just, you know, be an interesting factoid that doesn't amount to anything, but it's just interesting. 
very interesting because as far as I'm concerned, and I know there's a lot of debate about this, I, I think the Lear might slow down. Yeah, I, I agree. I agree. I mean, it, you know, it definitely was was equipped to to speed out of there, and and he didn't make a move. He didn't do anything. He didn't react. He, you know, Clint Hill was the only one that really reacted of all the Secret Service agents. For sure, for sure, he should. You know, the first first bullet, first gunfire. Yeah, he on the pedal. With, That's it. As soon as he car. heard that, he should have. Right. That's not a professional driver's instinct. That should be anyone's drive. Anyone hears a gunfire, you, you you get the bloody hell out of there. Not if you got the president. Yeah. Not just the president of the United States sitting behind you. It's just yeah, he he acted bizarrely for sure and suspiciously let's be honest yeah it was very suspicious so that's just an interesting thing i just wanted to uh throw right, in there but... thanks you actually yeah. came to this. <laughs> I have no idea about that that's very yeah well let's get on to the next question dave this is uh this is from jc in auburn california he says um if lennon was shot from the front then how does he not collapse and fall backwards dropping the tapes that he was carrying okay Good question. Good question. Okay, let's go with the tapes. This is a really interesting part of the, part of the case. Um, the first time we heard about tapes was when the concierge, Jay Hastings, said to a Rolling Stone journalist called Greg Katz, on the night of the murder, would you believe, um, about John having tapes, okay? Now, the way Greg Katz got to talk to Jay is quite interesting. Greg Katz is parents, do you believe, lived above the driveway, the very driveway that John and Yoko were walking into. I mean, what other coincidences? So Greg, being a smart guy, realised when the murder went down, I could get in to see mum and dad, so I can actually get into this crime scene, which is what he did. And then when he got in there, I think at that point, Jose Padermo, the doorman, and Joe Manny, the basement guy, were both gone off to the station. But interestingly, Jay Hastings never went to the station. Jay Hastings wasn't called to the station. Uh, when I asked Jay about this, he said I couldn't be bothered to tell him. You know, I, I gave statements in, you know, at the scene. I didn't feel the need to go and give an official statement. When I asked Joe Manny about this, I said, why didn't Jay go? Joe said, well, Jay seemed kind of blasé about it and said he didn't have to, didn't want to. I, I find that staggering that someone so important to the murder, someone who saw John allegedly just after he was shot, wasn't asked to go to the NYPD station and, and give a official statement. It's just beyond belief, but that's what happened. So Greg Katz, when he turns up, I think it was around about kind of half two, 3 a.m., Jay Hastings is still there in situ. So Greg goes up to Jay and says, can I interview you? Uh, he somehow, you know, obviously got himself in the building because it was mum and dad. And then he got down to the uh, concierge's office where Jay was there having a, apparently a stiff drink. And he said to Jay, look, can we have a chat? So what Jay did, well, Jay then did something quite interesting. He rang up to Richie De Palma, who is Yoko Ono's manager slash accountant slash lawyer slash fixer. Very interesting man, Richie De Palma. Much more needs to be known about Richie De Palma. He's still around, still working, but yeah, I'd like to know more about Richie, but he's a very difficult man to get information on. But anyway, Jay Hastings rang Richie, said, Richie, do you mind if I give my, my recollections to a Rolling Stones journalist? Now, why Jay felt the need to ring up Yoko Ono's manager, um, accountant, I think it's probably the best way to call him, and ask for his permission talk to the Rolling Stones about, about what he'd seen is just weird. But anyway, that's what happened. Richie said, yeah, you go ahead. Chat away, allegedly. So Greg sat down and got the first interview with someone at the murder scene who saw things, which is a brilliant scoop for Greg Katz. And it was a very famous article that the Rolling Stone magazine put out the next week. So what Greg got out of Jay was, Jay said, pretty much standard Jay stuff, to be fair, he said John staggered in and collapsed. He didn't give much information about where he staggered in and where he collapsed. And he didn't mention things like I've been shot, which Jay has added further over the years. But what Jay did say to Greg was tapes were then scattered all over the floor. Right? Tapes scattered all over the floor. That, that was the phrase. So everyone thought, oh, it must have been, I don't know, recording studio tapes or 
it must have been, I don't know, it must have been something they were doing because obviously they came from a recording studio. So people just assumed it was recording studio tapes. Um, so when I looked into the police voucher, evidence vouchers that I've got, which are fairly comprehensive and complete, I found a Sony Walkman, I think you'd call it, I don't think it was a recorder, but it was a kind of Sony Walkman player, very early prototype Sony Walkman player that John had on him. Um, and he had an, and one tape that was, we didn't say whether it was in the recorder or separate to the recorder, but you can actually see pictures of John on the day of the murder that Paul Goresh took actually holding this gray Walkman in his hands, much bigger than, you know, as they became in the eighties, you know, guys, they became quite small, quite sleek, those tape walkers. Right. But back back in those days, you know, the early prototype ones in LA were quite big and bulky. But you can see it, it's 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 a nice bit of tape probably for the time. Um, so I then said to Jay Hastings, I said, Hey Jay, I said, uh, this is when I first spoke to Jay, I've spoken to Jay many, many times. I said, There's uh, this tapes thing. I said, um, you said to Greg Katz that a lot of tapes were sprayed everywhere, but I've looked in the in, you know the evidence vouchers and there's only a recorder, a, a Sony player, Sony Walton player, and, a, and one single tape. Where 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 is the sort of tape plural come from? So, oh, don't really remember. Maybe it was an envelope. I don't know. Maybe I don't know. So that was Jay didn't want to really go into it. Um. But in one of my last conversations I had with Jay, I, I sort of badged him about this. I said, look, there's an, I don't like this anomaly, Jay. You know, you said, you know, it was an envelope, but you told Greg Katz it was tapes. The inventory voucher said a tape and a Walkman. You know, what, what's going on here, Jay? What was it? And in the end, he kind of went, oh, yeah, I kind of remember now. He re-remembered. He said, uh, it was tapes, just tapes with strewn everywhere across the floor. And I said, well, yeah, but only one tape was ever found in the evidence vouchers. Hmm. He's like, oh, maybe they got lost. Maybe they got picked up. Now, not only does this kind of throw into light Jay Hastings' recollections and, and the validity of a lot of what he says, but what it also, what's really interesting about the tape recorder guys, which is well worth remembering, is John Lennon had on, his, on him that night a, a leather jacket, right? Black leather jacket from Gap, but he only bought about a week previously. And it's got two, two pockets on the front. Do you remember those kind of pockets, those kind of big pockets that have a kind of, you can kind of, they were, they were kind of low down. They weren't the top ones, the breast pockets. They were kind of almost like sort of mid-range lower jacket pockets that had a flap over the top. So you could yeah. kind of, they were like, like pouches, almost yep. like two pouches that had a cover. So I think that's where John probably would have possibly had his recorder on him and his tape if he wasn't holding it in his hand. But if we go with Jay and he was, perhaps Jay got confused and he thought the Walkman and the and the, uh, the tape was tapes, plural, John would have had to be holding it in his hand, you would think, right? But here's the problem, guys. One thing we know from what Dr. Hannah and the nurses said uh, about John's wounds, and one thing that we can corroborate with what Elliot Gross has said with regards to the autopsy, so they both agree on this one point, and that one point they both agree on is that John's subclavian artery was completely severed, right? Now, when a subclavian, and it was his left subclavian artery, it's a massive big vessel that comes out of the aorta, which is connected to John's heart. Now, if a subclavian artery is completely severed, you lose all use of your left arm and your left side, okay? To the point where, you know, you're, you're pretty much disabled down that side. Now, remember guys what the official narrative wants us to believe that John had uh, had his wounds inflicted on him in the driveway, okay? Before he gets to the vestibule door. They have to have you believe in that because they know the minute he's in that vestibule and he's on the stairway, Mark Chapman can't see him. So he had some, his subclavian artery completely severed in the driveway for the official narrative to work, right? So John walks up to the vestibule door, which is a pull handle, okay? Now, how does he get, if he's holding the Walkman in his hand, which he was doing earlier in the day, and I suspect he might have been doing that night, especially if he drops it on the floor. How does he do that? How does he have a Walkman and a tape in his hand with his right hand or his left? And how does he get the door open 
properly. And then how does he manage to then go on this magical mystery tour that we know he allegedly did? Remember, his tapes have to go with him because the tapes was calling it in jail was found in the back office. Right. So he somehow managed to open the door with one arm and still hold the Walkman in the tapes if they were, remember they were scattered. So they can't, mm. you can't scatter tapes from a pouch pocket very easily. They're kind of going to stay in a deep pouch pocket. So he had to be holding them, I think, for Jay's story to stack up. So with one arm he, that was possibly holding something, and remember, he's got three other holes, guys, around his heart, remember? He's, just, he's supposed to pull open the vestibule door, walk into the very small porch vestibule area, walk up six steps, go through two mahogany doors at the top of those steps, turn left, go through a swinging door, which is attached to the front desk on the left, He's now in the concierge's front office, okay, back behind the um, concierge's front desk. He goes through that front office past Jay Hastings. According to Jay now, he says to Jay twice, I've been shot, I've been shot. He then carries on into a back superintendent's office and collapses. And allegedly scatters some tapes, which incredibly he must still be holding because it's very hard for those tapes to be scattered coming out of the patch pocket in the front of his leather jacket. So what, what I'm trying to say here, guys, is the tapes seem like a really superfluous, small detail, but actually little things like that give a lot away. You know, how was he holding them? Why was he holding them? Why did Jay say there were tapes plural when we know there was only one tape? Where are the tapes plural if there were tapes plural? Right. Most importantly, guys, the really important point here, and this is a good point to say it, is if you listen to the nurses and doctors who all saw John's wounds, right, on the night of that murder, even the one Dr. Lynn, the, the doctor who actually wasn't performing on John, but actually was in the room and saw John's wounds, even though he took credit for he shouldn't have took. But that's, he did, one thing Lynn did see is he did see John's wounds as well. And you take into account what Elliot Grosser, the discredited chief medical officer, they all said one thing universally and still do to this day. The second John was hit with those four wounds around his heart, he would have been dead instantly, instantly. They reckon maybe one step, two steps, he would have collapsed, 100%. Right. They all say the same thing. Death, I think Gross said death would have happened almost instantly. Um, Stephen Lynn said, even if he was shot in a, uh, uh, in a in a surgery room in a hospital, we couldn't have saved him because he would have died instantly. The nurses, yeah, with those wounds, instant death. Yet, we're being asked to believe, with possibly a Walkman and a tape, or if you go with Jay Hastings, plural tapes, in his hand, John somehow went from the driveway all the way up to the back office. Right. Impossible. And if you said, uh, and I forget the name of the artery that you said was severed. Um, it's called the subclavian artery. It's, it's his left subclavian artery. Yeah. It's, a, it's, it's a really big, it's, it, it basically controls all your left, left side, basically. All your left arm and your, your, your left shoulder and your left chest. It, it's kind of, it feeds, it feeds oxygen and blood to those areas. Okay. And once, then... it's, once it's gone, once it's severed, your left, your left side's gone instantly. A leg too? Would it would it, would it have been? No, legs, legs slightly different. Legs slightly different, but it, okay. it, you, you would have you would have been. It would not have helped your left side leg leg either. It, you, you, so it would have you would have very quickly gone very numb down your down your thigh and your leg. Sure. But the the problem is, guys, is kind of his heart couldn't work anymore. His heart was right. There was there was no heart left. There was nothing. There was no. There weren't many vessels left to actually pump blood to his whole of his body, not just his left side. Because remember, he had three other holes all around his heart area. Um, so amazingly, his heart wasn't here. Incredibly, his heart was still intact. But all the vessels around his heart were shot away. And the subclavian artery on the left side was the, was the most important one. That's the one that would have completely incapacitated him and he would have dropped. So this is, I can reveal now, guys, this is at the heart of the case. Really is at the heart of the case. Sure. It, it takes something to get the doctors and nurses and Elliot Gross and Dr. Lee and all to agree on one thing. But that's one thing they all have to agree on. The severity of his wounds. There's a clip I put up recently, guys, of, um, of John Hinckley Jr. Uh, just to give some context here. 
who's tr- who's attempting to, as you know, assassinate Ronald Reagan a few months later in March. Was it March? March 9, 8, March? Um, I think so, yeah. Se- yeah, there's a Secret Service agent called Tim McVie, I think his name is. Tim McVie. Big guy, massive guy, ex, ex-army, ex-military. Big old unit of a guy in a pale blue, sh- a pale blue sh- uh, suit. Looks the part. Looks like a guy you wouldn't mess with, right? Very big and powerful guy. When Henkley starts firing indiscriminately all over the place, Tim takes a bullet, right? And that bullet uh, skims his lung, and I think skims his liver, right? But Tim survived. But do you know what happened to Tim the second he got hit with that bullet? Just one bullet, not four. Didn't hit his heart. Do you know what happened to Tim? He, well, goes, down like, he goes down like a sack of coal. Right. Instantly. Right. Bang, down. This is a guy who's there to protect the president. No question, mm-hmm. a loyal guy. If he could have stood, he would have stood. He would have got in the way of the bullet. In fact, he, did, he does try again in the way of the bullet. But, you know, the guy's a hero. When the first bullet goes, you know, he goes over to get in the way of Hinckley and Reagan, and he, he takes the second bullet. But the interesting point is he goes down super fast. And you're trying to tell me that a skinny guy like John Lennon, smoker all his life, a guy who took numerous illicit drugs, drank like a fish in the mid-70s, a guy you could not say lived a healthy lifestyle. And they all said at the hospital, pretty, pretty skinny guy, quite emaciated. Yogi had him on some weird diets as well. Are you trying to tell me that guy with four bullets around his heart got up and started running upstairs and through doors and through, through offices and oh. talking to people? Yeah, there's it's no just, way. Huh? It's uh, uh, just yeah. nonsense. Nonsense. Yeah. But that's what they want you to believe. Because the cops, all the cops, guys, and I've spoken to them all, that got there on that scene, the first responders, and went into that back office, they all said two things. One, John was in the back office. That's where they found his body. But do you know what else they said, all of them? They said they found him face down. All of them, face down. Why is he face down? Yoko and Jay were there. Jay has said to me and others that when he first saw John and John allegedly ran past him, he went into the back office to see if he was okay. Jay told me that John fell slightly on his side, apparently, right? And John did have a broken left arm, by the way, so that kind of fits. And he said he very gently rolled him on his side and slightly on his back, and he saw lots of blood on his chest. And then he says he realized a tourniquet, you know, with his tie and stuff, no no good. You know, it's just the guy is too badly injured. And he said he heard a death rattle then. Jay said he heard a death rattle then and John coughed up blood. And he said, um, at that point, he thought John had died. So, okay, you're not certain of that, Jay. I'm sure Yoko Arne wouldn't have been certain of that. Neither, Neither apparently had medical experience. Why leave him on his front? Why leave him face down? A couple of minutes later, maybe three minutes later, the first cops turn up, he's face down. Why would you do that? Why would you leave John Lennon? Why would you leave your husband face down on a rug? Yeah, doesn't make sense. You know, that's that's how he was found. Hmm. <laughs> you know? Yeah. We're getting to the heart now, guys. We're getting to the yeah. heart of it. Yeah. <laughs> okay what's next well <laughs> answer that correctly was there another part to that question I no that was it that was it uh great answer dave uh, <laughs> fascinating the next the next one is kind of a sorry, comment sorry 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 sean just one last little code oh, go ahead take story. one last little coda um stephen spiro you know the guy that was very friendly with mark chapman right a, a, a cop of great interest to me, Stephen Spiro. Ex-Navy, as so many people in this story are. But anyway, ex-Navy guy. Uh, Spiro, not only did he become friendly with Mark Chapman, he made it his business to become friendly with people who knew John, right? Like people like Mario Casciano, who was an assistant to May Pang. And what Mario told me was, a few years later after the murder, Spiro invited Mario and May out to lunch, would you believe? Okay. And at that lunch, the tapes came up in the conversation because Mario and May must have heard about this tape. Well, they probably read Rolling Stone magazine. You know, they read Rolling Stone magazine. 
Greg Cat said tapes were scattered in the van. So obviously May and Mario knew that from that particular issue. And they said to Spiro, Mario told me this, um, what about the tapes? You know, what were those tapes? And and apparently Spiro tried to play it all down and said, Oh no, that's all a load of BS. No, no, there were no tapes. He said, actually, funny enough, he said, John had a Carol King tape on him, tapestry. He said, that's what we found on John. There were no other tapes. He said, that's all just lies. And so what Spiro was doing was, I think he was trying to downplay the importance of those tapes. And he was coming up with, there was no, in the inventory, in the, in the evidence vouchers, there's no Carol King tapestry tape. The tape that was with the Walkman was a blank tape. So Jay was lying. And what Jay, I think, was trying to do there was, was trying to deflect away from the importance of those tapes. And the fact that John couldn't really be carrying tapes and scattering them in a back office. And, and Jay Hastings' testimony that there were tapes is just completely untrue. So that's just an interesting little hmm. sidebar uh, about that whole tape story. Anyway, sorry, sorry, Sean. No, that's mm-hmm. great, Dave. That's great. Fascinating stuff. Um, so this one is from um this is actually like a comment. Um uh, it's an interesting comment. I, I don't really agree with it. Let's get your thoughts on it. But it says this is from the heavens fallen. All right, um, okay. I think I <laughs> Yeah, you might have seen this. He put it up on uh, YouTube after the episode. Uh yeah, why I've seen some comments from him, yeah. Yeah, why he says, Why shoot at Reagan months later? It does not seem to fit the narrative, but Nelson Rockefeller fits right in between Reagan and Nixon. Heck, he ran on a ticket with Tricky Dick and Lennon sang the song Rockefeller pulled the trigger. Um, okay. Not much need to look further for a motive. It was Nelson Rockefeller. Reagan and ne- Nixon is really a stretch. Now, I don't know, you know, from my research in the Rockefellers, Nelson was the political wing in a family. David was the powerhouse uh, behind the scenes. You mm. know, Nelson was the politician. Uh, mm. But I, I don't know. I don't see a, a Nelson Rockefeller angle here. I don't know what he's really trying to get at. Do you, do you, do you Dave? I can't say I found a Rockefeller connection. I haven't, guys. But what, what I can say for certain is I found a Nixon and Reagan connection. 100%. And not just a low down connection, a very senior connection, especially to Reagan, mm. to people who are around Mark Chapman. And my book will reveal all that. And I, and I think those connections are very telling. Uh, the, the, the problem is, you know, you know, this guys, these, these guys don't leave a paper trail behind them. No. Uh, so you can, you can only look at circumstantial evidence and you can only look at who knew who and who was connected to who and what was concealed and what we know and what we don't know. And, and, and who, I think the important thing with this case is to focus on who was around Mark Chapman throughout his life. And not only was the people that were around him up until the murder, but the people that made sure they stuck around him after the murder and controlled him after the murder, right up to this present day, in fact. And those people and their connections to Ronald Reagan and Richard Nixon are quite, for me, quite clear and quite disturbing. And I think it's those connections that give away the heart of the whole conspiracy. Wow. Um, because, it, you, just, you know, we talked about it before, guys. It, it's staring us in the face, the timing, you know. Lennon was back. He was getting active again. He was going to go on a march a week after his murder in San Francisco. Well, actually, no, it would have been a week a week in the new year in 1981, I believe it was. The, the tickets were booked. He was getting political again. He was, he was talking about a world tour. He was releasing music again. It wasn't that long ago when he was berating Richard Nixon. And, mm-hmm. you know, he was basically Richard Nixon's bet now. It was only four or five years ago when he was doing that. It would have been fresh in Nixon's mind. It would have been fresh in Rumsfeld and Cheney's mind, the people behind Reagan. You know, right. they would have known. That. They would have known that. These are the kind of guys that were in Reagan's crew. Yeah. You know, I'm not saying any of these guys organized the hit. But they'd, they'd have been talking about it. They'd be saying, oh, this guy's back. You know, he's coming back and runs in and we've got this big agenda in Central America. Do we really want John Lennon singing protest songs against Ronald Reagan? And we've got all this horrible stuff coming up. You know, we want, you know, we want to get eight years. We want to get 12 years. And this guy, you know, and there's a lot of, I'm sure there was a lot of talk that he could swing an election. And I think he probably could have done, to be honest. Yeah. John? He decided to. If he decided to get off his backside and go out there and do those rallies again and, and get get young people, because because people listen to him. When John Lennon spoke, people listened, and they knew this. So if Reagan literally 
about to take office a month later. John going at that point was a very convenient time. You know, and don't get me wrong, I don't think Ronald Reagan had anything to do with it. You know, as I think we discussed this again. I think he's an actor. Right. Made many too much. He did some good things. You know, Gorbachev, great. You know, fantastic what, what they did together. You know, with, you know, defeating communism, brilliant. But was that Reagan? Or was that other people? I don't know. That's right. a bigger question. But but here's the thing. I, I think the timing, and there's a lot of people out there. I speak to a lot of people, guys, who, there's been a, a, a reassessment of Nixon and Reagan, and we talked about this as well, where, you know, Reagan's seen as the great homesteader, you know, the guy who's, you know, standing his watch and you know, great values and there's all that family and all the rest of it and nixon was you know given a bad rap and they mm. you know they they kind of you know he was he didn't really know what was really going on what gay and you know he's secretly a great guy and it's, you know you, you, you guys see it more than i do it's in your country right. there's a, sure. I, 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 see, I see a re-evaluation for sure from this side of the pond i can i can read that and i, I think there's a lot of people on the right who still see these guys as some kind of you know heroes mm-hmm um and i just think they got they got crap memories <laughs> yeah <laughs> i mean that grand contra was awful exactly exactly and don't get me wrong guys our politicians are just as bad you know i'm not i don't want to give american politicians in a bad writer <laughs> right even me the British politicians are just as bad but you know while we're talking about you know where john was and the reason behind it i i think yeah i think you can't get away from the fact it was very convenient yeah for the reagan administration that john went um well, um, yeah, I yeah. You know, one thing we we've learned, David, is there's no such thing as coincidence. No, I don't think so. Not in this case. I think when you see the connections, uh, I think you'll see. Okay, yeah, all right. There might have been something there. There might yeah. have been something. Some people lower down the chain, you know, in that administration who spoke to some intelligence people. Possibly, I'm sure it was off books. You know, I think yes. I think Chapman was just picked off the shelf, guys. To be honest, I think there were plenty of Chapmans. Sure. I think he, I think Chapman went through a program, and I think he's like, okay, let's let's go with this guy. Yeah, this guy well, mm-hmm. the similarities yeah. to Oswald. Uh, it's you know, and and Sirhan. exactly. It's just Hinkley. I'd yep. say Hinkley as well. Yep. To be yep. honest. Yeah. Yeah. Dave, uh, do you mention Hinkley in your book a lot, or, or yeah, do you I want do. to do I, that? I, I okay. Do actually, yeah, I do because I think. I, I talk. I mean, there are connections, obviously, between Hinckley and MP Ultra, and you know, anyone who studied the case will know about the Catherine Ryan in his hotel room, which I thought right. was very difficult for. I don't know if I spoke to you guys about this, but basically, after the murder, Chapman was very happy to talk about and allowed to, very importantly, to talk about how the fact he was doing it to promote the book Catherine the Ryan. And um, Interestingly, the nefarious hypnotists who were sent into his cell initially in the first few months, because we know through journalists a little bit about what they spoke to Chapman about, they were very much kind of, oh, yeah, great, catch is brilliant, Mark. You could do a movie, Mark, where you, you know, you could, you could be like Ben Hur and you could come into a great big arena, Mark, holding catcher in the air, you know, and everyone cheers and like, you're the great catch a promoter and you're the guy who's made this amazing book the greatest book in the world he, he really was embedded in that book mentally and I, I think that was all done deliberately through hypnosis by the way I, I don't think it's like mark just suddenly got crazy about a book i think it was very deliberate i think the book was a trigger device but what, what was very interesting about all that guys quite telling is once hinkley did what hinkley did or what he tried to do and uh and um you know, he was caught and that book was found in his hotel room. Almost instantly, the the hideous hypnotist that was in Mark's cell at that time, your Bernard Diamond, your Milton Kynes, your Richard Bloom, your Emmanuel yeah. Hammers, you know, all first class hypnotists with intelligence links. And obviously with Milton Klein, you had the MK Ultra link. Um, they it immediately turned it and Catcher was off the menu. It's we're no longer dealing with Catcher Mark. Hmm. Catcher's we we and it became a different operation then suddenly it was capture was never to be discussed again it was all about demons wow. it was all about you possess mark and the d de- you think you possess you think there's demons inside you and and that it was it was almost like a kind of very conscious catcher's getting a little bit too hot for us here guys we need to because hinkley has a copy 
And I think that was an error. And I think they needed to kind of squash catcher forever and quash that Hinkley Chapman connection. And if you, if they kept on allowing Chapman to go on and on about catcher, I think that connection would have got stronger. And I think you know if, if you look at Chapman now, it's it's switched away from De- they they basically concentrated on demons for about five six years. Or you know they, they basically gaslit him. They 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 had guys going in. This is where this kind of Southern Baptist thing came in, where you had guys going in there performing exorcisms on Mark and basically gaslighting him to a horrific degree. To make you think that he was possessed by demons, and obviously they must have used drugs as well. I think to make that make that work. And Mark said, you know, for sort of two or three years, he was burning red red light bulbs in his in his cell, and he was praying to Satan, and he could feel these demons coming out of him, and it was it was just horrendous. And you know, Glory was part of this as well. She 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 joined in, and uh, and I think it was a very deliberate ploy. To get him to completely forget about Catra in the right and make him be convinced that he was possessed by demons and demons made him kill John Lennon. And, and, that and Dave, one of the one of the interesting things about Hinckley uh that's fascinated me is the the family connection, the Hinckley family to the Bush family. And and that's you know, that's out of like the Alan Dulles playbook. Like Alan Dulles, you know, who was very close to Bush's father, Prescott. You know, he he kind of like, you know, he has these connections, obvious connections to Oswald, uh, people connected to Oswald, like the Paines and George de Mornschild, you know, and it's kind of like, uh, I want you to know I did it, but I don't, you know what I mean? And that's kind of like, I, I get that that connection with Bush. It's like, that's too much of a coincidence that that the Hinckley family and the Bush family were close. Awesome. I mean, you know, the, the father, Hinckley's father and, and Bush, Daddy Bush were friends. That's, yeah. that's a fact. Um, I, I think it gets slightly conflated though and slightly confused because I mean obviously we know you know Daddy Bush was you know part of CIA right. so that's you know, so that that's where that would have all tied in quite nicely. But where people get carried away and they do bad research is there's there's a lot of people online who talk about um, World Vision being part of the refugee camp that Mark Chapman worked in in, in the mid seventies, right? Right. And and they go, oh okay, so World Vision was run by Hinkley's dad. And World Vision ran this refugee camp that Mark Chapman worked in, so that's all linked together. And yeah, it must be Bush, and Bush must have done it because he knows it. The, 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 and this is where that's so frustrating. I see this so often, where you get these, and we could talk about this actually, myths actually that, that, that come up. And we talked a little bit about Padermo, that myth, the Jose Padermo myth, right. was really been difficult. But what's interesting about the um, about the uh, the World Vision one is, is is how it how it came about this how this myth has been allowed to to kind of grow is is um, World Vision were working at this Vietnamese refugee camp, camp that Chapman was working in Fort Chaffee in the mid seventies, but they were only there to resettle um, orphans, Vietnamese refugee orphans in, in Christian homes. That that was their specific job. The YMC specific job was to go in there, and there was lots of different Christian agencies that were going in there volunteering. Now, they were getting paid as well. It was a nice gig. But the YMCA were in there, and this is where Chapman came in under the YMCA umbrella, to, to help out with recreational stuff and to, and to be a kind of counsellor for the children. So, so Mark played with the children, and he was a kind of a, a, a nice ear for them to lean on. And that was it. So they had the, you know, the World Vision sort of job at the, at the camp, you know, you had the YMCA work going on at the camp, and the camp was run by the American government. It had nothing to do with World Vision. World Vision were just hired to do a specific job, as were lots of other Christian organizations. But what, what bad researchers do is they go on and they go, all right, okay, refugee camp, let's have a look down here. Okay, who was running it? Don't, I'm not really going to check who's running it. Oh, World Vision, who are they? Oh, oh Hinkley Senior. Oh, George Bush. Oh, there, there's, that's it. I've, I've solved the case. <laughs> that's it. It's, it's right. Bush and Hinkley yeah, and they, they organize it here and it must be them and yeah and it's, it's just bad research because these refugee camps there's books written on them we, we know how much they cost i think they cost something like 350 million dollars at the time incredible, you know to run and i think 250 million of those dollars actually went to the u.s defense department so you know there's big business in refugees because they've got to be looked after and, and there has to be have to be bills issued for looking after these people um so you know you can you can you could, this stuff's all, all out there. You can find out who was in that camp, what they were doing, how much it cost, you know, where the bill ended up. And, you know, that Bush Hinckley connection is definitely there for the Hinckley Reagan assassination attempt, 
very suspicious that George Bush's family knew the Hinckley family. Christ, it couldn't be more suspicious. Mm. But with regards to Mark Chapman and Ford Chaffee and the Vietnamese refugee camp, that, that's a complete fallacy. Right. Yeah. yeah. And, and it, go, it goes along with, while we're at fallacies, guys, just quickly, that absolutely infuriate me because they come up in the comments. Oh, John was killed because he, he knew Paul was dead is real. Yeah. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah, it's like, really? You think that's a possibility that Paul died in a car accident and they replaced him with a doppelganger and John and George and Ringo went, oh, okay, cool, yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's some crazy ones out there. The oh, we'll, keep, we'll keep that quiet. Oh, and yeah. this guy's going to come to speed and he's going to be able to play and write songs like the old Paul. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Sure. Of course. Yeah. Of course. And the family are all cool with it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The family are all cool with it. Right. Yeah, he's back to fine with it. Uh, I mean, it's, it's embarrassing. Yeah. But, you know, yeah. they say... You can't be taken seriously if you, but so many people buy into this rubbish. And then, then, then I don't know if you guys have heard the Tavistock one. Have you heard the Tavistock one? No. There's a play, there's a center kind of it started after the Second World War. There are nefarious connections to the Tavistock Center. It's, it's kind of um, a kind of mental health institute, it's got some kind of military intelligence links it's, it's an interesting place and it is an nefarious place and, and there's there's more research that needs to be done about what they got up to in the 50s and 60s just like so many other institutions at that time but there is a theory would you believe that the tavistock center or people within the tavistock center created the beatles mm. they, they the beatles were a tavistock center creation and they were they were created to kind of divert the kids and, and all the songs were given to the beatles through the tavistock center and it was just and the amount of people that see normal that believe this is, is disturbingly large. There's a lot of people that buy into this stuff. And, and the problem with it, guys, is and I'm, I'm, a, you know, I'm a free speech advocate. You go and talk about your Tavistock and your ball is dead till your heart's content. But the problem is when, when you do my kind of work and you get people commenting on it going, oh, yeah, he's done some great stuff, but what about the ball is dead? And what about the Tavistock? And, yeah. you know... It's like, oh, it's just, it just, you know, guys, it's just, it's just frustrating. It, it is, really it's is. frustrating. Right? Yeah. It's, like, it's, it's humorous. Yeah, I'd like it to know who was, who was writing those songs then, if it wasn't. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> it was just the guy who out in the basement oh, some government building is right in Penny Lane. I mean, really? Really? Yeah. Oh, there you go. Amazing. <laughs> This one, guys, there's one more they, they, they drag out as well. And rather than put this one to bed, is John faked his own death. So, oh, boy. oh, sure. And, and the way they go with that is this is the, this is the one crumb of evidence that they, they pull up is that the doctors and nurses initially weren't sure that it was John Lennon. But that, that's, that's the only bit of evidence they've got. And that they are right. When John first came in, a couple of the doctors and nurses weren't aware. Because they're at the moment trying to get an IV going and they're cutting off these guys' bloody clothes. And they're, you know, you can imagine the adrenaline pumping. They're not really focusing on his face and his features. You know, eventually some of the cops told the police and doctors, you know, that's John Lennon. And, you know, one of the nurses said that one cop tugged her on the side and said, you know, that's John Lennon. So I think they, they found out pretty quickly because it, you know, it got around pretty quickly. Uh, you can imagine someone that famous coming in, but but you know, just because they didn't instantly know it was him, doesn't mean that John Lennon faking his de death is is a is a credible theory. But so many people again come up with this theory, and it's just like you, I, I don't know, I don't know how, I don't think we can ever stop it, guys. Because I think no, you can't, because they no. say the same thing about JFK. I had a guy message me the other day that JFK faked his own death, and I'm like, all right, have a nice day, goodbye. <laughs> It's yeah, I, oh. I, they, are funny, they are funny, but it, I, I think the reason it bothers me is, is, is you know, it, guys, you know, how the conspiracy theory phrase is thrown against us. Oh, yeah, and, and, and it's those guys, they're mainly, yeah, they give the bad name, right? They just lumped in, yep, they, I ran over. Sorry, guys, that's all right. No, that's okay. Well, I think this, this is a good place to, uh, to wrap up, David, and and you know, your book, uh, available. Should be available this week that, uh, you know, that we're talking about mind games, the assassination of John Lennon. And, um, you know, we'll, we'll provide a link, uh, to, you know, to where you can get that book. Um, Thanks, and, and I'm sure your sub stack, you'll, you'll have that as well. Oh, yeah. Uh, yep. Yeah. Yep. There'll be a lot of social, um, announcements, right. uh, about where you can 
to get it. And uh, and obviously, I'm really looking forward to getting people's feedback. Please, you know, I can't wait to hear what you guys think about it. I can't wait to do a new show in the new year. Yeah, all right. Uh, well, congratulations on the book, Dave. Thanks, guys. Yeah, I'm, I'm really excited that it's coming out at last. And uh, I'm really looking forward to seeing where the investigation goes next. Yeah. And if you uh, if you happen to come across the pond for a book tour or anything, uh, let us know and maybe we'll... Oh. Uh, you know, Fantastic. You, you're, you're here yeah, anywhere, we'll, we'll come and Love see you. It'd be great. <laughs> yeah, it's great to meet in person. You, I re- honestly, guys, I, I mean this. You guys are fantastic. You, you, you really do your research. You ask interesting questions. You know, you, you're, you're, on, you're on the case. And uh, just keep up the good work, guys. I, you know, you, you do an uh, amazing Thank you, job. Dave. Same to you. And, oh. you know, you're one of our most popular guests. So you're welcome anytime, buddy. Absolutely. Thanks, guys. All right, David. David. Uh, David Whelan, Mind Games: The Assassination of John Lennon. Uh, I, I'm I'm looking forward to it. And, and this Absolutely. is absolutely thank thank you so much, David. Thanks a lot, guys. Thank you, David. All right, Thanks, that's that's enough out of you. That's enough out of you. Podcast is executive produced and written by Bill Rader and Sean Kane, and edited by Bill Rader. The That's Enough Out of You podcast and logo are exclusive property of Bags of Chicken LLC. Any rebroadcast, retransmission, or accounts of this podcast without the express written consent of Bags of Chicken LLC is prohibited. So don't even try it.